morning, kids. Welcome to our children's message. I'm Teacher Naomi. Kids, um, this is the third Sunday after Easter, or third Sunday after Jesus resurrected. Kids, when Jesus came back to life, He appeared to people several times. One of those times it wa- is what will be discussed today. Um, let us watch first this video, kids. Pero itong story na to is may kita rin natin sa John chapter 21, verse 1 to 19. Some of Jesus' followers were together when Peter said, I am going fishing. Okay. So they all went out to the sea, but caught nothing all night. At dawn, they saw a man standing on the beach. Oh, hey, over here. The man called out to them and said, Have you caught any fish? Nope. The man said, Throw out your net on the right side and you'll get some. Uh, okay. So they did, and they couldn't bring in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then one of the men on the boat said to Peter, It's Jesus. When Peter heard that it was Jesus, he swam to the shore while the others pulled in the load to the boat. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Mmm, I miss a fish. Got it. Jesus said, Come have some breakfast. While they were eating, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Peter said, Yes, you know I love you. So Jesus said, Then feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked again, Do you love me? Peter said again, Yes, you know I love you. And Jesus said, Then take care of my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. So he said, You know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said one last time, Then feed my sheep. Kids, napakadaling sabihin ng I love you. But it is sometimes a lot harder to show it by our actions. That is what our Bible story is about today. Sa video natin, kids, after kumain ng disciples, kinausap ni Jesus si Peter at tinatang niya natatong beses, He loves you. Why did Jesus ask Peter the same question few times? Because kids, Jesus wants Peter, pati tayo kids, to love him the most, more than anything else. In similar way, God wanted Abraham to uh, love him the most by taking Isaac, his only son, as an, or- as an offering. Kids, um, Jesus deserves such love from Peter as well as love from us because he had given us his life as a sacrifice on the cross. By his death, kids, um, by his death on the cross, Jesus first demonstrated he had loved us more than anything else. Kids, God himself also deserves such love from us because he gave us his one and only son, kapalit ng mga kasalan. Kids, something wonderful happens in our hearts when we open our mouth and not confess tayo uh, that Jesus, I love you. Yung sinabi ni Peter na, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It was more than a confession of love. It was a declaration of a sinner called found endless mercy and forgiveness through the unconditional love of Jesus. Kids, it was Jesus' love, therefore, that empowered him and enabled him to confess his love to Jesus with all his confidence. Kids, uh, today, kids, let us make a confession of a love to Jesus when we have accepted His uh, forgiveness and love in our lives. The Hilton kids, I invite you to stand up and uh, sabayan niyo kami ng ibang teachers uh, sa mayawan ko. tell me to walk I will talk when you tell me to talk I will go when you tell me to go and I'll stop when you say so I will walk where you tell me to walk I will talk when you tell me to talk I will go when you tell me to go and I'll stop when you say so I will run when you tell me to run I will come when you tell me to
historian and moralist known as Lord Acton, held the opinion that a person's sense of morality diminishes as their power increases. You've probably heard quoted some version of his statement, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. That's a pretty bold statement. However, with every passing chapter of history, Lord Acton is continually proven to be right. Notorious examples of absolute power can be seen in the people like Napoleon Bonaparte, who reached a, a point where he saw fit to declare himself an emperor. Even worse are the Roman emperors who went further to declare themselves gods. This kind of power is a self-determining power where might makes right. If you have the power, you can do whatever you want and be whoever you want. You answer to no one. Today we still have power players who crown themselves arbiters over everyone else and declare themselves to be all-knowing demigods who are above question. There's a long list of powerful people whose corruption stains the pages of history. It seems Lord Acton knew what he was talking about. But it's not just the powerful elite who suffer from such corruption. It isn't all of us to want to be the masters of our own fates and captains of our own souls. And this futile pursuit has not only stained the pages of world history, but it has left a stain on our personal histories as well. And there is no amount of power that we can possess to undo it. There is one, thankfully, who is powerful enough to rub out the stain. Only his power is of a different sort. It's the power that comes in the form of a slain lamb. He ushers in his kingdom, not through brute force and domination, but through the power of sacrificing his very self. Rather than leveraging power for the sake of himself, he leverages his power for the sake of all of us. It's the power of the Apostle Paul equated with the cross. This is not how we think of power. For the power brokers of the world, this sounds like foolishness. But Jesus, the slain lamb of the cross, has broken the chains of our self-determined sinfulness and erased the stains of our corrupt history. Listen to the vision of his throne recorded in the book of Revelation. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Jesus' power does not come by self-appointment. It is received from his Father, who sent him into our world to rescue and redeem us. For this reason, the Father gave him the name above all names. He is the one we answer to. For this reason, we bow down to the only one who is worthy and whose power never corrupts. I'm Jeff Broadnax, speaking of life. What if you were suddenly offered a new job? All you had to do to take this new job was quit the job you presently have, one you have prepared for and studied for and worked toward your whole life, so just quit that. Uh, give up your home, uh, leave your family, give up your entire way of life and everything that you've believed and everything that's been important to you, just give it all up in order to take this new job. But this new job offers you some things. Well, it promises you very little pay, but it does offer you a lot of hours and a lot of suffering. How's that job offer sound? <laughs> Not too good. No, no, it doesn't. But, uh, you know, 
That's what happened to a person by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He was offered a new job. And we're going to read about that story today. Saul of Tarsus, better known to most of us as the Apostle Paul. Now, Saul was his Aramaic name that he used when he was among the Jewish folks. And Paul was, as many people had two names in those days, was his Roman and Greek name when he was in the rest of the Roman Empire, not in the Jewish community. So he was both Saul and Paul. And today we're going to look at him and his job offer and ask ourselves, what would I have done if I were in his place? And consider what that answer may tell us about ourselves and our Christian lives today. So we're going to look in the book of Acts at chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 20. But uh, first, let's, uh, let's get some background that leads up to our story there in Acts chapter 9. Now, we first encounter this Saul of Tarsus at the stoning of the newly appointed Christian deacon Stephen. And it appears that this Saul was a Hellenistic Jew from the city of Tarsus who was living in Jerusalem at the time. He was a rabid Pharisee, as he called himself, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And evidently, he was in charge of the group that stoned Stephen to death. After Stephen's execution, this Saul then launched a severe persecution against Christians in Jerusalem. He dragged men and women out of their homes and put them into prison. Then he wasn't through. He wasn't satisfied with that because many Christians then began to flee Jerusalem. Maybe thousands fled. And Saul was going to go after them and not let them get away. So we next encounter Saul at Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. So let's look there. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Luke tells us, Meanwhile, Saul was still, in case you've forgotten, still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, we might think, wait a minute, he was a Pharisee. He was a law keeper. He was dedicated to the law of God, and he wants to kill people. He wants to commit murder. I thought that was wrong. Well, you have to understand in Saul's mind, he sees himself as, as a Phineas who kills people for God. He sees himself as a Maccabee who killed people to free the Jewish people from uh, foreign captors. So he's murdering people, but he sees it in the light of he's doing it for God. He's zealous in that way. So he is reading out murder threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. Now, stop, think about that for a moment. He, he just up and went to the high priest. You didn't just up and go to the high priest, unless you're Saul. Now, we read in his epistles and in the book of Acts that Saul was a very young man at this time. A young man, but a very zealous Pharisee and seemingly well known. He had to be well known in order to get an audience with a high priest, who probably was Caiaphas at this time. Now, he may have not only been well known, I would suspect that this Saul might have been well to do. And that could be why he was able to get an audience with a high priest the way he was, because the high priest was a Sadducee, and Saul was a Pharisee. And they didn't particularly get along, those two parties at that time. And yet, this young man Saul got an audience with the high priest. So he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Now, these were probably letters of recommendation. And later we're going to see that they may have been letters to extradite these Christians back from the synagogues in Damascus to bring them back to Jerusalem to put them in prison. So he wanted letters to the synagogues. Notice that, synagogues, plural, in Damascus. Now, Damascus was a large city in Syria. 
but it had a very large Jewish population. And it would seem, reading between the lines here, that Saul had imagined that, you know, Jewish people fled all the way to Damascus in the past. I bet these Christians who fled the city, I bet a lot of them went to Damascus because there are a lot of Jews there and a lot of synagogues in that city, and that's where I'm going to go and look for them. And Damascus was about 135 miles north and north uh, east of Jerusalem. That's a six-day walk. Now, I think we're going to see that they didn't take donkeys, they didn't take horses, they probably walked for six days. I mean, you talk about zeal, but Saul is out to get these Christians and put them in prison and maybe execute them. So he wanted letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's what Luke calls the early church the movement. He calls it uh, horos, which means road or the way. But he means a way of life, a way of living. So Luke here tells us that's what he was looking for, this manner of life that people who follow Jesus. If he could find any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women. Oh, one thing we can say about Saul, he's an equal opportunity persecutor. He doesn't care if you're male or female. He'll put you in prison and kill you. So he might take them as prisoners. That's, he's going to extradite them now. He's going to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So we see this persecution is initiated by Saul. This murderous threat, this imprisonment of people who follow Jesus is initiated by the Saul of Tarsus. Now, it's supported by the high priests. It's supported by the religious leaders who give him the authority. But make no mistake, Saul is the initiator and the leader of this movement of persecution. So he's on his way to Damascus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, and he tells us later in the book of Acts, it was about noontime. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, unexpectedly, a light from heaven flashed around him. A phos in the Greek, you may be familiar, phosphorus, phosphorescent, phos, a light from heaven, appeared, it flashed around him like lightning. Now, Saul immediately, as a good uh, Bible student, master, doctor, teacher of the law, recognized this phenomena immediately as what we call a theophany. A theophany means God just shown up. So when this bright light came from heaven, flashing like lightning and lit up the noon sky, and uh, later in, in Paul's talking about this, he said it was brighter than the sun. He knew this was a theophany. He understood what was happening. So verse 4, he, that is Saul, fell to the ground. He was just standing there and he fell. He didn't fall off his donkey. He just fell to the ground. And he heard a voice say to him. So he heard a voice. But not just the sound of a voice. He heard words. And he understood what the words were saying. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now Luke here transliterates the Aramaic for Saul into Greek. But as Paul later explains, the voice spoke to me in Aramaic. His heart language, you might say, called him by his given name, Saul. Notice it calls it twice. Now twice a double name is significant because uh, you know you might go back to the burning bush. You might go back to Mount Sinai. You might go back to the call of Jacob. You might go back to the call of Samuel. But in every case the calling and commissioning of a servant of God in the Hebrew scriptures was preceded by a double name. Saul. Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who? 
Well, whoever this heavenly voice was, he's accusing Saul of persecuting him. Now, Saul doesn't yet know who this voice is, but I suspect he thinks he's in trouble. Because this heavenly voice just says, you've been persecuting me. And Saul's probably like, what? Why in the world would this voice from heaven say that to me? What we see, what we begin to see here, though, is this voice from heaven is Jesus. And Jesus identifies so with his people. I mean, the church is the body of Christ. And Jesus identifies with his people. And he is saying, Saul, when you persecute my followers, you're doing it to me. What you've done to them, you're doing to me. Verse 5, Paul, or Saul says, who, who are you, Lord? And he uses kurios here. Lord. He doesn't know yet, but he calls him Lord. I mean, Paul knows this is a theophany, and there's a voice from heaven. Uh, it could be an angel, but I'm not taking any chances. I don't know who this heavenly voice is, but it's a heavenly voice, and I'm going to be a respectful Lord. Saul asked, who are you? I don't know. Listen to this answer. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Can you imagine what was going on in Paul's mind when he heard that? Say what? Jesus, you're dead. But I hear your voice like you're alive and it's coming from heaven. I think I could be in trouble. And you say that I am, notice that if you're familiar with that Greek expression, ego of me, I am, in the Greek Old Testament, when Moses asked the God in the burning bush, who do I tell Pharaoh you are? And God said to Moses, tell him, ego a me, ego a me. And so Saul hears these words, ego a me, or perhaps he heard it in Aramaic though, but it still was I am. I am Jesus, and that's the emphasis, I am Jesus, you, emphasized in the Greek, are persecuting, he replied. Saul thought he was serving God. Saul thought he was a righteous person doing God's will. And now this voice from heaven of, of the one who he hates, whose followers he hates and wants to kill, is not only alive, but in heaven. <laughs> Oh my, how could things have gotten so upside down for me to be in this situation? So, verse 6, the voice says, but, and that's in the Greek, but, now get up. This is the Lord's command. Get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now, I hope you remember one of our favorite words there, day. Translator in the English, D-E-I, day. Luke uses it over 40 times in Luke Acts. And every time it means the same thing. Must, it's the plan of God, it's the will of God. This is what God says, this is what you must do. So it's God's will. You will be told what you must do. A divine necessity a part of the will and plan of God is what you're going to hear, Saul. Now, the men traveling with Saul, so he has a whole posse, you might say, going to round up these Christians, probably Hellenistic Jews who were Pharisees, just like Saul. So the men traveling with Saul stood there. Notice they're not on horses, they're not on donkeys. Uh, I think that's a popular misconception. They stood there, speechless. I guess. They heard the sound. The, the Greek says they heard a voice. Now, later we're going to find out that they, they say they didn't, they didn't hear what was said. So how do we interpret this? Luke, we have to put all of what Luke says together. But they heard a voice, but that doesn't mean they understood what it said. So they heard a voice, a sound. But they didn't see anyone. Someone's talking, 
Not sure what they're saying, but I don't see anybody. Well, after you've just had a light flash brighter than the sun, you're probably not going to see much. So they didn't see anyone. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground. Remember, he fell down. Later, when he tells the story, he's going to say they all fell down. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. He was blind. He was now blind. So they led him by the hand. Notice no horse, no donkey. They led him by the hand into Damascus. Now, isn't that ironic? Picture Saul. Saul's a young man. He's dynamic. He's well known. He's probably wealthy. He's zealous as all get out. He's fired up, man. He's ready to go get some people and put them in chains and take them to Jerusalem and maybe even see them executed. He's all this. And now all of a sudden, he, he's a blind man who's led by the hand because he can't see where to go. Think about the irony of this. Saul is being led. Later, he's going to be the leader of all the Gentile Christians. Saul is blind. Later, he's going to remove the blindness from people about who Jesus is. But right now, he's the one being led, and he's the one who's blind. A very humbling situation. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. A little irony there, isn't it? For three days, he's in, he's in the dark. Three days, he's in the dark. Three days, he's blind. For three days, he was blind. It did not eat or drink anything. A total fast. A total fast of humiliation, repentance, uh, awaiting revelation and you have to understand what what Paul or Saul is going through here is what's called liminality liminality is the uh, intermediate stage uh, between two rites of passage the best way I could describe it is say you're you're not quite a teenager anymore, but you're not yet an adult. You don't know what you are. You don't know who you are. You have these feelings of a teenager. You have these feelings of an adult. And you're somewhere in between. That's called liminality. Being stuck in between two planes of existential existence. It's like being nowhere. It's like a rite of passage, but I haven't gotten to where I'm going to be, but I'm not where I was. Where am I? They call that liminality. That's what Saul is in here. He doesn't know who he is anymore. He doesn't know what's happened to him. He, he doesn't know what's going on. Now, in this state of fasting for three days, blind, do you think Jesus spoke to him? Do you think Saul learned anything? Do you think Saul had any revelations? I don't know. But one thing we're going to find is after three days passes, we've got a new person. We've got a person who's forever changed by this event in their life. Verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Hanias. Yeah, that's the way it would be pronounced. We say Ananias. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Hananias. Well, it doesn't say he was ordained. It doesn't say he was anybody special. He was a, a disciple, a Christian. Paul later describes him as a very devout and pious man. Now, I think that's important because this Ananias is really going to be the one who's going to have to tell people what happened to Saul is for real. The change that's occurred in his life, you can believe it. I was there. I was a part of it. God revealed it to me as well. I'm giving credence. I'm giving backing to what happened to Saul. I will stand by him in this. So in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, another vision. There are a lot of visions. Luke loves visions. In Luke acts there are lots of visions because that's how people got revelation. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, a witness, what's he a witness to? 
He's a witness to what's happened to Saul. He's a witness to a change in Saul that takes place, a witness to Saul's conversion. Now, I take great issue with the NIV here. If you're reading the NIV, it says, yes, Lord, he answered. Now, I don't know what happened to the translators and why they translated this, yes, Lord. I think perhaps uh, they uh, perhaps would be uh, listening to the hymn, I'm trading my sorrows. You know that hymn? Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Maybe they were listening to that in the background, but that's not what the Greek says. What the Greek says is, behold, I. Well, now, how would we better put that in English? I'm saying the better way to put that in English is, here I am. Here I am. Ananias. Here I am. Now, why here I am? Isaiah. When God called and commissioned Isaiah, what did Isaiah say? Here I am, Lord. Here I am. What did Mary say when she was told by the angel Gabriel what was going to happen to her? Here I am, Lord. What did Abraham say when he was called and commissioned? Here I am. What did Moses say when he was called and commissioned? Here I am. That's why, please translators, <laughs> the best translation of the Greek here is Ananias says, Here I am, Lord. So verse 11, the Lord told him, arise, the NIV left that out, arise and go. You got a mission here. I'm sending you on a mission. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Okay, think about this for a moment. Damascus is a big city, huge city. Now, Ananias has some clues. First of all, the guy he's looking for is Jewish. So probably looked in the Jewish part of town. And he's from Tarsus. That's, that's a well-known big city. Uh, people are going to know somebody from Tarsus. And he's on Straight Street. Now, why would you call it Straight Street? Well, most streets at that time were curving and winding. But here in Damascus, they had one street that was straight. And from what I've read, that, straight, that Straight Street is still in Damascus to this day. And it runs east and west through the city. So at least he has some idea of where to begin looking for this fellow Saul. All he has to do is ask around. And somebody's, you see a blind man from Tarsus uh, out on State Street? Do you know this guy Judas? So he found him. Find him for he is praying. Now that tells us something about Saul, doesn't it? What's he doing? He's fasting. And he's praying and he's blind and he's probably down on his knees or maybe down on his face on the ground, humbly seeking God's will. One thing you'd say about Saul is he's zealous. He's passionate for the Lord, misguided maybe, but passionate. And now he just wants to know, Lord, what are you doing in my life? What is going on? What is happening to me? I don't know. Verse 12, in a vision, we got another vision. This is what, about the third vision now? In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So Saul already is aware that Ananias is coming and that he's going to lay hands on him and that he's going to be able to see again. But he's going to see in a way that he's never seen before. He's going to have a new vision of everything after this. Now, verse 13, Ananias voices, if, if you're Luke's readers, you're going to say, I wouldn't have gone there. <laughs> that guy's dangerous. It might be a trap. So Ananias asked a logical question. Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. <laughs> Are you sure you want me to go there? Holy people, that's uh, the first, I think about the only time Luke uses this expression, hagios. Saints, holy ones, 
for God's people, calling them the saints. Now, it's interesting that Luke uses the term once because Paul uses it all the time in his writings. So here, we kind of pick up on that Luke knows Paul pretty well. I've heard all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. So word gets around. I mean, 135 miles away in Damascus, and, and they've already heard, probably from those who fled, you better look out for this guy, Saul. Now, I call this sermon, Better Call Saul. Why had you better call Saul? Well, if you don't call Saul, if you don't give him a calling and change him, he's going to kill all the Christians. So you better call Saul. So that's what the Lord did. He called Saul, and here's his calling. So he said about this Saul, he's come here with authority. What kind of authority? We don't know, but here the Jewish religious leaders support and are behind all of this. He's come with the authority from the chief priests, plural, the whole family. The Jewish religious leadership is supporting this, giving authority to it, backing it up. Saul is the instigator. He's been the persecutor. He's been the leader. But you got to know where this really comes from. It comes from the religious leadership in Jerusalem. He's come with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name, the saved, the holy ones, the followers of Jesus. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. Better translation, he is my vessel of election. Why vessel? Well, because the verbs here actually talk about carrying something, and you carry it in a vessel. In other words, Saul is going to be the vessel who carries the gospel to, get ready for this, Gentiles. Whoa! Ananias is going to have to deal with that, too, because he never heard of anything like that before. But this individual, this Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel. And later in Paul's writing, he's going to tell us that God called him from, from birth. This was God's will and God's plan for him all along, and he went off in a different direction. But God has got him back as his chosen vessel to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. So he's my chosen instrument to proclaim, to carry my name to the Gentiles. Wow. And their kings, double wow. Uh, and the people of Israel, we're not going to leave them out. Luke wants to, even his Gentile readers to know the, the Jewish people have never been left out by God. It's just that they didn't want to come along. Thousands of them did, but most of them didn't. But Saul's mission is going to be to the Gentiles. Verse 16, I will show him how much he must. What's the word there? Day, D-E-I. He must suffer for my name. Ouch. Wow. Ananias, tell Saul this is his calling. This is his commission. This is what he must do. And he's going to suffer. You might say, well, he's going to get as good as he gave. He caused God's people to suffer. He's going to get some suffering too. And know what it's like. Called to suffer. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul. Now, why did he do that? Well, it's the Old Testament ceremony of, of the laying on of hands. And why did, why did someone lay hands on someone else? Well, it conveyed a blessing. It conveyed power. It conveyed authority. It conveyed healing. But the healing was a blessing, and it was the authority from God. So there is a conveyance of authority and blessing and empowerment and commissioning on Saul by the hands of Ananias, representing that Jesus is doing this through him to Saul. A commissioning ceremony, you might say. So he placed his hands on Saul, and listen to this. He said, Brother Saul. Brother. He called Saul his brother. 
the persecutor, the killer, the murderer. But now he's a brother. Wow. What a change. And Ananias welcomes him into the community, into the family. He's my brother now. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here. The risen Lord didn't just appear on Easter. He didn't just appear during the 40 days after his resurrection. He appeared again here. He appeared to Saul. And later the Apostle Paul is going to write, I saw the Lord. He appeared to me. The same Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now from our studies in Luke and Luke Acts, I hope we remember what that little phrase means for Luke, filled with the Holy Spirit. What does someone do after they're filled with the Holy Spirit every time in the book of Acts? You get filled with the Holy Spirit, then what do you do? Preach. Very good. You preach. You proclaim. You prophesy. When Luke says someone gets filled with the Holy Spirit, it means they're just about to preach. So that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit, because you're going to preach to the Gentiles eventually, a few years from now. That's a few years down the road from this event. But in the meantime, you're going to preach to the Jewish people. And then one day, you're going to preach to the Gentiles. So filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales, like scales, like flakes, possibly a metaphor here, something, it fell off his eyes, and he could see again. Wow. He got up. I don't know whether he'd been lying face down or on his knees or whatever, but he got up and was baptized. Now notice he was filled with the Holy Spirit before his baptism. Why did he get baptized? He got baptized as a part of the community, the body of Christ, entering into the death of Christ, into the community. He was welcomed and he was baptized. He was now a Christian. After taking some food, he regained his strength. So he's back to the world again. The liminality has passed. <sighs> I've made the transition between where I was and who I now am. I've made the transition. It's time to eat and drink and get on with it. So then we find that Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And here Luke jumps over some time and maybe condenses the story. He says nothing about Paul going to Arabia or anything like that happening. All that Luke wants his readers to know is Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Doing what? Don't know. And at once, though, listen to this. This is what, this is what Luke wants his readers to get. At once, immediately, he began to preach in the synagogues, plural, of Damascus, that Jesus is the Son of God. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. For Luke, what did he go do? He preached Jesus in all the synagogues of Damascus. Now the Jews had heard he was coming there. The news had traveled of what he was there to do. Can you imagine the shock when in the synagogues they heard this man, Saul of Tarsus, preach Jesus? On believable. Indeed, a miracle had happened. So what do we learn from this story? Well, what we've just read is, is one of the most amazing conversion stories of all time. And it's really not so much of a conversion from one religion to another as it is a conversion, a radical changing from a belief system and, and a way of life. What we read is a call and commissioning of a prophet and an apostle by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to us, to you and me? We are challenged by Saul's example. Wow. Would we give up everything and leave our comfort zone 
to be a vessel to bear the name of Jesus Christ to others? Would, would we do that? Would we do what Paul did? Are we willing to face persecution, challenges, and even suffering? To participate actively in sharing the gospel and letting people know that Jesus is the Son of God, are we willing to do that? And that in Jesus we have forgiveness of all our sins, we have salvation, we have eternal life. Are we willing to say, here I am, Lord? Are we? All I can do is pray. And if you will join with me in prayer. May the risen Lord touch us through the Spirit so that we might rise up, be healed of our blindness, be healed of our complacency, and say, here I am, Lord, send me. I will go wherever and to whomever you send me, no matter the sacrifice, no matter the cost, I will go. I will follow Paul as he followed Christ. And in Christ's name I pray, amen. Let us pray. Father, especially in times of affliction, perplexity, persecution, and being struck down, hide us under your wings. Cover us within your mighty hand so that when the oceans rise and thunders roar, we will soar with you above the storm. With this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ and making us one with all your people. Let us take the bread, eat it, and allow it to become a part of us. Jesus, in us. Let us drink the wine or juice, drink it and allow it to become a part of us, Jesus in us. Now, O oh God, send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
In Mark 12, 43, Jesus comes to the temple with the purpose of teaching us a lesson about giving. He deliberately sits in front of the offering and watches as people put their money in. Many rich people come and put in large amounts of money, but Jesus wasn't looking at the amount. He was looking at their hearts. Finally, after all the rich people had showed off their tithes, a poor widow comes in and puts in two small coins worth only a few pennies. But this is what Jesus had been waiting for and he doesn't waste a moment. He quickly calls his disciples together to teach them about the kind of giving that pleases God. He explains how giving out of your abundance isn't what God is interested in, because it doesn't help you rely on him. This is what the rich people were doing, but the widow was different, and the difference was in what she was trusting in. The widow trusted God, knowing that he would stand true to his promise of providing for her needs while the rich people trusted in their money. Jesus' point was that giving isn't about the amount, it's about the sacrifice. What and how we sacrifice will be different for each person, but we all have the ability to make sacrifices in our giving. The danger comes when we follow the path of the first group of givers. We give to look good, or we give out of a perceived obligation, or we give as a means to some other end. But God isn't interested in this kind of giving. The only giving that interests God is the kind that makes Him a priority above our money. This is why what we use our money for is such a big indicator of where our hearts are at. When we sacrifice something we want and give instead to God, we show that He has the top spot in our hearts. The poor widow trusted God and gave everything she had to Him. And this is why Jesus makes a point to highlight her sacrificial giving. Because as we follow her example, she leads us right to Jesus. How to send our offerings? By bank deposit, or online banking, or mobile wallet app, GCash. Please send your offerings to BPI account number 1991. 001235. Kindly email a screenshot of your offering to debbie.orogo at gci.org and or doris.panubay at gci.org or send screenshot of your offering via Facebook Messenger to Deb Season Orogo and Doris Manubay. Please include your name and church area so that your offering will be credited to your local church. Go from here, paying attention to God's new work in you, partnering with God the Holy Spirit in your daily renewal. Regardless of anything else, do not lose heart, 
for there is the abode of God. If your heart be troubled, God will share your agony. If your heart be triumphant, God will share your gladness. So sisters and brothers of Christ, let us live with thanksgiving in our hearts. Go forth with forgiveness and grace. Go forth with compassion and love. We go as Christ's family for all the world to see. Amen.